all for being here. I'm Beth Ben Scott, the Land Captain and Professor of Human Rights here at the Law School. I'm really pleased to welcome you this evening um, to an event that's co-sponsored by a number of local human rights organizations, including the Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice here at Stanford and Gamerica 37 International Justice Chambers, which is a new, um, relatively new, I guess still, um, new international justice non-governmental organization focused on bringing universal jurisdiction cases in courts around the world, doing human rights advocacy, doing work with victims, transitional justice, etc. Offices in London, Madrid, and here in San Francisco. Um, I wanted to just announce our next event um, is coming up. Well, there's a number of other events, and if you're on the Honda listserv, you'll get them. And if you're not, you sign up. But um, Matthew Stubbs, who's a visiting scholar from the University of Adelaide, will be speaking on space law and human rights. He's an expert on space law, the laws of armed conflict, and military activities in space. So I hope you can join us for that. December 6th at noon. Um, location provided. <laughs> so it's a secret. Um, so I hope you can join us for that. Um, I'm really pleased to invite you all for this event. Um, we have a delegation in town for the weekend. They're doing a big workshop on reparations and victims' participation at Santa Clara University School of Law, and we're really pleased that they can be here on campus to share some of the work um, of the Trust Fund for Victims at the ICC. The Trust Fund is very much a creature of a new emphasis in international criminal law on not just retributive criminal justice, but also thinking about the rehabilitation of victims, of issues around restitution, of restorative justice, and of including victims more actively into justice processes. If you think about, at least in the US system, victims and witnesses are just that. They're witnesses for the prosecution. They don't necessarily have the ability to shape the way the justice process works. And then at the back end, they're not often able to receive reparations through the criminal justice process. They have to bring a separate civil suit at times in order to receive compensation. The ICC statute, which was drafted by states, interestingly, is very forward-looking in terms of the way it's tried to mesh both the retributive, retributive elements of criminal justice and these more restorative elements. By giving victims voice, they have greater participatory rights in the ICC than in other domestic systems or any other international tribunal that's out there. And also creating this new institution, which is the Trust Fund for Victims, which we're going to learn more about this evening. So these are some of the themes we'll be talking about. We have a terrific panel here to help discuss these. Um, First to my immediate left is Mutu uh, Nagochi, who's the chair of the board of directors of the Trust Fund for Victims. He's also an ambassador for international judicial cooperation and has worked with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. He's also served as an advisor to governments undergoing transitional justice processes. Um, we also have Felipe Michelini, who's uh, also a member of the board of directors of the Trust Fund. He's an attorney who works on human rights and international justice issues and an honorary commissioner to the Working Group for Truth and Justice in Montevideo, um, Uruguay. And finally, to the far left, we have Erin Rosenberg, um, who's a US attorney based out of in, um, Indiana. She's a legal officer at the Trust Fund for Victims, and she also teaches as an adjunct at the University of Cincinnati School of Law. Um, and I'm Beth Van Scott, uh, here at the law school. So I'd like to start, if we could, um, we're going to have this be a very kind of more of a conversation rather than a panel of separate um, presentations. We'll talk amongst ourselves for about half an hour, and then I'll open it up for questions. So feel free to save your questions um, in, uh, until about maybe a little bit after six. So first, Chairman, maybe if you would start by just talking about the origins of the Trust Fund for Victims. Um, it was created by the Rome Statute, but what inspired it? What are the origins of it? How is it structured? Maybe just some of the basic background. Uh, yes, uh, as you have described, the international criminal justice have never treated victims uh, anything more than witnesses uh, during the first uh, several decades. And perhaps uh, next to the Cambodian extremely chambers, uh, the ICC uh, is the first of such a court, uh, which uh, in the area of international criminal justice uh, allowed the participation and reparations of victims in a very systematic manner. Uh, the trust fund for victims was established by the Rome Statute itself according to Article 97. And it's kind of uh, autonomous institution. Uh, of course, it's an inherent uh, system, a part of the system of the Rome Statute, but outside of the three organs of the court. And in that sense, we call it autonomous organ. Um, 
the fundamental notion is for the ICC launch the Duke mechanism to have a special fund, uh, trust fund for victims, to take care of victims' uh, sufferings uh, through reparations and uh, assistance. So it is really innovative uh, structure for the first time in the history of the international criminal justice and has been working for almost 15 years, but we still see it in a very infant stage of uh, uh, practice. Great. Now you mentioned that the trust fund has two mandates. It has its reparations mandate and its assistance mandate. Um, Felipe, maybe if you could talk a little bit about how those two mandates operate and how they intersect with each other. Yeah, well, first of all, uh, uh, thank you and also organizing parties and the Campus Center for Human Rights and the Stanford University. Uh, second, eff effectively, the, the trust fund has two mandates. And one is very clear, it has to uh, fulfill the rulings of the court in terms of preparation. So once there is a conviction for, for, for a person for the crimes within the the Roman statute, genocide, crimes against humanity, uh, war crimes, and aggression. The second mandate is the system mandate. It's a very innovative, uh, I would say, uh, figure of this uh, system because uh, it represents victims, even if there is not trial or even if there is not a conviction. It just has to be a situation within the scope and the goal of the, of the statute. So that allows the international community through the Roman statute to reparate these huge human rights violations, not necessarily waiting for the results or outcomes of a trial. The Bemba case is clear. You know, there was a, a, a all proceedings were fulfilled, mm -hmm. and clearly the, the the court is not the first to act. Supposedly the state has to act, and the, the court triggered its jurisdiction if uh, the state cannot or doesn't want to prosecute. So in that sense, uh, the system uh, then has identified 5,000 victims by name of huge abuses, particularly those of gender and sexual uh, uh, kind. And at the end, the appellative chamber decided that the accused was not guilty. So in formal terms, there were no victims because the, the, the trial decided it was not crime at all. So the system mandate allows the system of the wrong statute to act even though there are no uh, ruling with the punishment of a uh, perpetrator. Yeah, just a little by way of background for people who aren't familiar with the Bemba case, this was a case involving violence in the Central African Republic. Um, he was convicted at the trial level for command responsibility over his troops who committed a massive campaign of sexual violence and looting. Um, and the sort of theory of the case was that Bemba couldn't really pay his troops fully and so what he essentially said was, take what's yours, right? Pay yourselves, basically, while you're in the Central African Republic. So a very strong judgment out of the trial chamber that in a startling um, outcome was reversed on appeal. Um, and the, the judgment is quite um, controversial amongst experts on international justice because not only did it change the standard of review on appeal, making it much less deferential to the trial chamber who saw the witnesses, who had access to the case file, et cetera, also seeming to raise the standard of proof for command responsibility. Um, and so what's remarkable about the trust fund is it's actually not dependent, as Felipe said, on having that conviction. It can still undergo its assistance mandate in the Central African Republic, even absent that judgment. So 
and really this will be the only justice I think that these victims will see. Yeah, Erin, want to add it? Yeah, actually, maybe just to jump in on what you just said sure. about the distinction between reparations and assistance. As, uh, uh, um, is it, I think it was, <laughs> Lenny, sorry. What a first name <laughs> was saying is that um, when the court has jurisdiction over what's called the situation, the trust fund is able to move in under its assistance mandate. What we mean by a situation is, sounds complicated, it's not. It's actually when the, the uh, procedure has moved from the preliminary examination to the investigation stage, the situation is what's defined by the prosecutor. But then the case, the reason why we're able to act under assistance mandate is because Bemba was acquitted um, in terms of the causal nexus having been established between the crimes and his actions, or having not been established according to the field chamber. The crimes themselves were not overturned. And that's a really important distinction. It's not necessarily the case that the trust fund would be able to go into a situation following an acquittal um, and under its assistance mandate in all situations. Um, that is possible that um, because the trust fund assistance mandate is linked to, as both the chairman and Felipe have said, um, addressing harms from crimes. So there does need to be that. Has the ICC implemented its reparations mandate? Or sorry, has, has the ICC issued reparations such that you have been able to implement your reparations mandate? Yeah, so far there has been three reparations orders. In firstly in Lubanga and then Katanga and thirdly in Alumani cases. And we have started uh, implementation of the first two uh, cases, uh, it, uh, although it's a partial. And for the third one, Alumani case, uh, we are about to submit actually tomorrow yes. <laughs> the final draft implementation plan for Alumani case. So in December last year in the Assembly of State Parties uh, uh, in New York, I reported to the state parties that uh, the past 24 victims have uh, started the implementation of uh, reparations orders for the first time in the history of the court. Uh, so that, that's the uh, present stage. But, uh, Having said that, uh, victims are still waiting for uh, actual uh, benefit to be arriving at them. Uh, in a similar manner to assistance mandate, the implementation of uh, preparations are procedurally very complicated, uh, involving international competitive bidding to select implementing partners, etc. So it takes uh, much longer than victims uh, suppose for them to get the benefit. Now these funds, yes, sir. No, no, no. In terms of reparation, the, the truth is that uh, in this uh, uh, 16 years that the court is uh, working, uh, the, the, the rulings are cases have been very few. So in that sense, the, the truth is that uh, we have, uh, as the chairman was saying, working or fulfilling the, the court orders basically in three cases, Lubanga, uh, Katanga, and Amadi. Very interesting particularities of the Amadi case because it's a very different case of any other have seen in human rights uh, because it's related to uh, the destruction of culture or religious property. Um, in the Mali situation. In the, in the Mali situation. So, uh, in that sense, the, I would say that the trend of Shazman has been the assistant and as uh, Erin was saying, is not uh, uh, something that the trust fund, the board of directors can do without any criteria. So it has to be real situation within the 
the goal of the statute, and the trust fund has to notify the court just to uh, inform that we are going to work on that, and, and the court can oppose for different reasons. Um, one thing I would maybe want to mention about implementation in terms of reparations is that the ICC, unlike other um, <coughs> courts that operate in post-conflict situations, the ICC was designed specifically to intervene in ongoing conflicts, um, both from a criminal perspective, but this also has very real ramifications in terms of implementation of reparations. Because it means that the trust fund and our implementing partners are tasked with implementing in-country uh, reparations um, in situations where you may have an ongoing conflict. Um, that, of course, uh, is the situation in Mali, but it is also um, very much um, uh, not necessarily the same ongoing situation, but there is an ongoing situation of unrest and violence in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, which greatly affects um, the ability to implement and how we go about doing it. Um, one other minor point I would say is that reparations, and you know something about reparations because they're public, right? They're a court order. We do uh, press releases about them. Um, but again, in terms of implementation, um, there's an issue of victim safety, security, um, in relation to just criminality, not in relation to conflict. That is another implementation issue. If you announce that the victims of a village, such as Pogoro, each receive $250 of compensation, and that's in a press release from the International Criminal Court, and it is the trust fund that has been tasked with delivering this, you have already made the situation much more difficult. How are you now going to do that? Because every time that the trust fund shows up anywhere near Pogoro, there will be an assumption that we have money with us. Any time a person goes to any type of event associated with the International Criminal Court, they are at risk of being robbed, potentially being injured because of the idea that perhaps they got money. So these are just some of the aspects that are very much the real on the ground um, things about implementing reparations. When we talk about reparations, I think our heads immediately go to this idea of individual cash payments, monetary reparations. But you're also empowered to think about collective reparations, symbolic reparations. Could you talk a little bit in kind of maybe concrete terms? What are the types of work that you or your implementing partners have done on the whole range or the continuum of, of reparations that you might consider in a community? Everything from psychosocial rehabilitation to cash payments, as you mentioned, to training. Chairman, want to start? Yeah, fundamentally, it's uh, for the chambers to decide uh, which modality of uh, reparations to choose. Uh, according to our rules and regulations, there are two, roughly two kinds of reparations, collective and <coughs> individual. Um, generally speaking, in the Lubanga Appeals Judgment, which uh, provided for the first time uh, general principles for reparations, uh, provided that, uh, generally speaking, the cases, magnitude uh, of cases and uh, the number of victims in typical cases before the court uh, would uh, require a collective approach, uh, more natural, more physical. And that tendency has been complied with uh, by the bill judgment, Lubanga uh, first reparation order, and uh, to a great extent uh, by uh, two other reparations orders so far. Uh, the, uh, concrete uh, programs content of reparations, either uh, it's individual or collective, uh, will be gradually developed uh, through uh, reparation proceedings before the court uh, the trust fund is uh, trying to uh, consult with victims throughout the proceedings. In the earlier stage, uh, before the reparation order is issued, uh, it is uh, fundamentally for the victims uh, 
representatives uh, to submit uh, victims' preference for the sufferings, uh, how they could be best uh, addressed. And once the declaration order is issued, the uh, trust fund is then directed by the relevant chamber to submit a so-called draft implementation plan. And during that process, we really conduct uh, uh, intensive consultations with victims, uh, either to, through legal representatives or directly, and to consult also with local and uh, central government, and international and local uh, NGOs, and to try to come up with a draft implementation plan which could best suit uh, the sufferings of uh, actual victims. See, let me underline uh, this last part that uh, our chairman said, that uh, the trust fund, when they find a plan for operation, even with uh, just money, just rehabilitation, symbolic collective. Uh, uh, the last word is the, by the court, but the process involves the victims, involves their uh, legal representative, involves the victim and witness section and, and the victim participation and reparation section. It's uh, not just taking the victim as a beneficiary of something that somebody else resolves what is good for them and period. Instead, there is a process of participation, of listening. And I think that verb is essential because victims in general, the first problem that they have is that they have no, they have nobody listens to them. So the idea of this process, of course, is much more complex. Mm -hmm. More in terms, as uh, Eric was saying, that uh, this program has to work within the conflicts that are, are, are current. Um, but I think it's much more fair, and at the same time, shows that the wrong statute is not only with a goal of punishment. It's a very clear reparative system and we will have uh, also the prevention on, on these crimes. Eric, you spent a lot of time in Central Africa working with some of these programs. Do you want to talk a little bit about your experience? Sure. Um, well, and actually, I'll, I'll talk a little bit also about, um, in terms of reparation, more of the Congo, um, also to give sort of the differences. But um, I think one of the things that's important to understand is, as the chairman said, reparations are, can have two, there are two types that is individual and collective. And then we have what are called modalities of reparations, which are, as a fancy word for some forms, basically. So modalities of reparations can be compensation, can be restitution, can be rehabilitation. Um, a modality can be ordered on an individual basis or a collective basis, if that makes sense. So these, these two work together. Um, the thing that's really interesting, I think, about the Rome Statute is how much diversity and discretion that leads to the trial chambers. Um, and what I mean by that is that deciding on a modality and a type, it really um, depends on how you define the victim group um, or sub-victim group. So to use the Bhanga as an example, um, as Chairman Noguchi mentioned, the uh, trial chamber ordered collective reparation rehabilitation, and this was affirmed by the appeals chamber. But within that, there are two distinct classes of victims, which are indirect victims and direct victims. I don't know if anybody here knows what the Nubangri case is about. Maybe it's not going to be So it's the, it's the recruitment and forced conscription of child soldiers. So a direct victim is a, is a former child soldier. An indirect victim is their family. So when you start thinking about programs, rehabilitation programs, for these two groups, they're actually very different. Right? What we mean by economic rehabilitation for parents who may have lost uh, <laughs> their child that they were depending on uh, to perhaps continue uh, working in, uh, if they're farmers, for example, which much of the, the Hamer community is, um, 
That's very different than if we we're talking about a young 20-odd-year-old person who was taken out of school, never had an education, raised in a very violent environment, and what type of psychological and educational rehabilitation they might need. So already, even though we say you know it's collective and it's rehabilitation, it sounds very simple, but it's actually much more different based on who the victims are. In Katanga, the trial chamber ordered individual compensation, 297 victims. They took a route which basically closes the reparations proceedings. They identified 297 victims. Each person was awarded $250, and then they were all awarded as a class four forms of collective reparations, um, housing assistance, education assistance, psychological rehabilitation, um, and oh, an income generating activity, so economic rehabilitation. Um, but again, within that, the trial chamber ordered the trust fund to design our programs taking into account the harm, both the type and degree of harm suffered by the individual. So what we ended up doing was actually designing sub packages um, or reparations packages based on whether a person had suffered, for example, pillaging and the loss of their home, or for example, pillaging of their livestock and cattle. So really breaking down into different groups, um, and then the response of those four categories very much depended on what that person actually suffered and what their current situation was. Um, and then of course, as um, Felipe mentioned, you have the Almani case. Um, which again, you have individual reparations, compensation, collective re reparations, um, rehabilitation, but who the victims are are completely different. So individual compensation was awarded. Let me back up, I know that Felipe mentioned this, but this involves the destruction of mausoleums in Timbuktu. The mausoleums were protected by the descendants, the direct descendants of the saints buried in the mausoleums. So the individual reparations are only to the family members, the actual descendants of the saints, whereas the collective reparations are for the entire community of Timbuktu. And this is very different if your ancestor's burial site was destroyed versus how you might feel as a member of a community where a very important historic and religious object has been attacked. That harm and how you respond to it is quite different. Um, so I don't know if that was the kind of detail you yeah. wanted, but to kind of show how these things work together, instead of just saying you know, collective, individual, there's a lot of nuance that goes well, into there's, it. They're so bespoke, which yes. is, I think, really important. You all have mentioned this idea of implementing partners. Could you talk a little bit about how you choose implementing partners and then what the relationship is between the trust fund and your partners um, in the various situations in which you're operating? Uh, fundamentally, the trust fund ha does not have a huge staff. We have around 15 people in the Hague and in the field. And uh, we need uh, literally several hundred people at least working for our programs uh, in different countries. So our, uh, we fundamentally uh, delegate our, our work to uh, be uh, implemented by our local implementing partners. With uh, close collaboration and oversight from the Trust Fund Secretariat. And fundamentally, we uh, uh, go through uh, procurement to select them, uh, based uh, primarily on the quality of their submission. Uh, we already have, in case of reparations order, we already have a reparations order. And draft implementation plan, which is already approved by the chamber. And based on these documents, we uh, get a proposal from uh, as many uh, implementing partners to be, uh, and uh, get through the selection process. And in the end, once we uh, select uh, several partners, we distributed the uh, entire amount of work to several different uh, NGOs depending on their expertise, either 
for example, uh, medical surgery or uh, psychological rehabilitation, or education opportunity or uh, micro financing. Uh, each organization has one or more uh, specific expertise and uh, we combine their total sort of, uh, expertise and experiences to implement one whole program. Let me express that uh, um, the work with NGOs or, 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 or organizations in the field, as the chairman said, is uh, essential for us because we don't have the, 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 the people in the field to, to, to work on that. And however, the process to define with which organization we work is done by uh, I would say fair standards of uh, accepted criteria to decide which is the best. And then there is a scrutiny in, in, in terms of how the, the money that was assigned to those uh, projects were spent. Because at the same time, um, there is a kind of uh, fairness to the donors that we are watching that the, the money goes to the victims and not uh, 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 goes to some, some, somewhere else. Um, you mentioned psychosocial rehabilitation. It strikes me that some of the places where you're working, you won't have indigenous resources around trauma therapy, etc. <coughs> How do you find those resources and then bring them? Yeah, no, that's a, that's a huge um, problem right at the moment in terms of reparations specifically because under the assistance mandate capacity building of organizations in and of itself is a is a big part of what the trust fund does actually. Um, for example in Grand Islander it's assistance mandate program the trust fund partnered with the uh, one of the universities to establish an actual degree for trauma based counseling. Um, in reparations you can't use the reparations that are meant for victims to do capacity building for organizations. That, and that's not a part of what the actual reparations funds can be used for. Um, which means that, for example, in the Central African Republic, there are two uh, counselors who are uh, trained in trauma-based counseling in the entire country. Um, entire country. Yeah, in the entire country. Um, in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, there is there are more, but it's not more than a handful. Um, so, what, as I think both the chairman and Felipe have mentioned, the trust fund generally, in terms of implementing partners, um, has a preference for local implementing partners. That's something that normally the trust fund would always maintain. In this specific situation, this is an area where you really have to look at getting outside international organizations to come in and to provide the assistance and see if maybe they have, separate from our program, some type of capacity building partnerships that they might be able to do. Um, but it's, it is also on the other side as well. Because those infrastructures don't exist, you also have a real problem um, in terms of getting victims to accept psychosocial services as reparations. Probably the biggest response that you'll hear from people is whether or not they want it is that's not what reparations is though. That's something else. They, they don't conceptualize it necessarily as what they can buy in the world for reparations. So am I correct that no funds have come from convicted defendants yet? Yes. So all of your funds come from donors. So can you talk a little bit about who your donors are? Uh, so far, uh, our main and almost sole donors has been state parties. Uh, we have major donors uh, mostly from Europe, uh, Sweden, uh, Finland, Germany, UK, Netherlands, um, Japan. So we are getting about three to five million euro per year uh, these days, and almost entirely we depend on the voluntary contributions from uh, these state parties. Uh, 
uh, that is uh, one of the uh, biggest problems for us. So the board has been working uh, to sort of strengthen the financial basis for us and uh, trying to cultivate a few more ways uh, rather than the warranty contributions from state parties, but uh, it's not very easy. In terms of reparations, uh, of course, legally speaking, it is uh, based on the liability of the convicted person. Uh, so, theoretically, he or she has to pay for that. But there is a, a provision that allows the trust fund for victims to complement uh, the award uh, in case of the indigency of the convicted person. And so far, in all three cases uh, where the reparation orders have been issued, convicted person who are found indigent and the relevant chamber uh, requested the trust fund board to consider complementing the award either a partially or entirely. Uh, and we have been able to uh, get the necessary funding uh, for Katanga reparation order in its entirety, uh, 1 million euro, uh, 1 million dollar and for the Banga uh, reparations order, out of $10 million, we have secured uh, 3.5 million euros so far. And for the money, uh, we have secured 50% of the total 2.7 million euros. That's the situation. If I could just take a pause and introduce Alina, to one of our graduates. Um, there's some flyers floating around about an initiative that she started with a course that I taught on atrocities prevention and response, and she had a project on funding international justice. And um, she's just completed her master's in conflict, transformation, and social justice at um, Queen's University Belfast with a Marshall Scholarship. Um, and she created a GoFundMe site, so maybe you can talk a little bit about your project. Oh yeah, so hi everybody, I'm Alina. There's a couple of these flyers floating around, but if you didn't get one, there's more outside, so um, be sure to pick one up. But so as part of a uh, best class uh, two years ago, we decided um, looking at the different funding streams that were available to the trust fund for victims to try something very Silicon Valley-esque, <laughs> crowdfunding. Um, so here is a link. We've created a new a new fundraiser um, specifically to be um, associated with this conference, but there's information about the previous uh, fundraiser that we did two years ago. We made a goal of about $10,000 and we were able to kind of um, plug into our, our networks at Stanford here and abroad and send it around. So hopefully if you can get the chance um, to, we'll, we'll send this out electronically as well, to visit uh, fundraiser.com um, slash fund the TFE, so easy to remember. Um, and whatever you want to donate or send to your networks, I think that would be really fantastic to associate with this. It's a fantastic initiative. <laughs> <laughs> that way, that way. Do what we can. <laughs> I was going to just mention there are actually uh, or there's one other way in which the trust fund can be funded, um, which is through fines and forfeitures from the criminal proceedings. Um, article uh, 76 relates to the Article 5 court crimes, um, which is that in addition to an imprisonment sentence, uh, the court can impose a fine and can also order the forfeiture of uh, proceeds derived from the crime and those can be transferred to the trust fund. That's distinct from reparations. The person is liable for the reparations orders. If they receive a fine, that comes to the trust fund, but it is at the trust fund's discretion as to how to use it. It doesn't get deducted from the reparations award. The other part of that is uh, we also have the ability at the court um, to have contempt proceedings if necessary. Um, and so uh, against the uh, crimes or uh, offenses against the administration of justice. And um, these, uh, this has occurred at the ICC, and the reason why I bring this up is because uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba, who was acquitted of uh, the crimes of rape, murder, and pillaging, was convicted for bribing witnesses in his case, and that conviction was upheld. And he was given a fine in the context of the contempt case of 300,000 euros, as was his lawyer, who was his co-conspirator, who was fined for 30,000 euros. So that's 330,000 euros to be transferred to the trust fund. Um, 
now, again, because we are a court of law, this is all on appeal. Um, <laughs> so who knows when it will be final and when it will actually end up in the case list. But that is another um, source of. Uh, just See, first, the uh, initiative of fundraising is, is great. Secondly, let me express that uh, now we are in a crossroad in a way because when the, the assistant mandate started 10 years ago, it was just uh, the Uganda and the Democratic Republic of Congo, basically. That's the world, the two, two big cases. And, 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 and now we have uh, claims very legitimate from Cote d'Ivoire, from Mali, from Georgia, from Central African Republic linked to, to Burma. So uh, it's clear that the system is uh, putting a lot of pressure in terms of the, um, the reparations through the system. At the same time, um, I would say that the, the donations could be matched. So the donor could say, I will uh, put some money for a trust fund for victims of uh, sexual abuse or for rape for children. So that's another modality that could be uh, work. 